All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to continue and hopefully finish up with the circle method and try to get a sense of what are the technical difficulties. So in what we were doing before, we were mostly looking at Goldbach type problems, trying to write something as a sum of two primes, three primes, and more generally s primes. We looked at the function fn of x was the sum p less than equal to n of log p e to the 2 pi i px. So the log p weights, they make the applications of number theory counting much easier. And they can be removed by partial summation at the end of the day. The other way of looking at it is if your goal is to prove that there is at least one representation of a number, say the sum of two primes, the sum of three primes, do you care how many ways there are? You just care that there's at least one. So if you show that there is, that this weighted number of representations is positive, then the unweighted number of representations must be positive as well. Right? That's the only way it could happen. So in some sense, if you only care about proving that there is a decomposition, then you don't need to remove these weights. But if you do care about how many ways can you decompose, which is a very natural question to ask, then you want to remove these weights, or you want to study the weighted quantity. And in a lot of things in analytic number theory, it is significantly easier if you put in these weights. All right, so what we're going to do now is we saw that fn of a over q looked like the sum over r mod q. We often put in a star or a prime to remind ourselves that it's just over the r that are relatively prime to q. And then we had the e to the r a over q, and then we had the sum over the log p's, which was going to be essentially n over phi of q plus small. So it looks something like this. And I'm just going to constantly check my notes to make sure I'm not making any major errors. Good. The question is, of course, how small is small? And this is where we count primes in arithmetic progressions. This is from counting primes. The better we can count primes, the better we can have for small. Right? The problem is we don't have really good formulas for counting primes in arithmetic progression unconditionally. If you think about it, we don't even have good formulas for counting primes unconditionally. Right? We can get the main term, you know, the number of primes up to x is x over log x, but if you want to then say, well, what's the error term? We expect it's on the order of square root of x, maybe a few logs, but we can't prove that. We have these horrible things involving the exponentials of things that are really close. You know, you have a small savings, but we don't even have, you know, log savings or whatnot from li of x. It's unfortunate the situation things are at. The idea is that these are very elementary sums, and that there should be ways to evaluate these sums in closed form. And in particular, if we sum over more things, this might get even easier to understand. What else could we sum over? So I've got this expression right now for fn of a over q, and it's a sum over r. What else could I look at? What could I sum over? One number with different moduluses. Okay, so what would I be summing over? Like R and then Q ranges. Good, so I could let Q range. Yeah. And I could look at all numbers of the form A over Q where Q is ranging. I could also let A range. And so I could sum over lots of different choices of A and Q. And the idea is more sums, more cancellation. <coughs> so this is a general principle. The more things we can sum over, the more things we can average over, the more of a chance we have of making something work. And then the question becomes, how can we exploit this? So the idea is to split 0, 1 into the major arcs and the minor arcs. And the major arcs are going to be the places where the function is large. The minor arcs are going to be the places where the function is small. And I believe we're going to let q be log to some power. So yes. So 
fix b, let q equal the log of n to the b divided by n. And then m of a q is equal to a over q minus, uh, I'll get this right, q over n. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm just going to let q, I thought, I'm sorry, I'm just letting q equal log n to the b minus q over n a over q plus q over n. So what can you tell me about the size of this interval? What do you think about the size of this interval? Big, small? Small. Why is it small? I'm letting n go to infinity. Q is only going logarithmically. Which a and q do you think I have to be a little bit careful about? The way I've written this, there's one choice of a and q that I have to be a little bit careful about. A equals zero, because if a equals zero, this wraps around. So if a equals zero, you have to be careful. You know, they, these are wrapped around. So we need some here if a equals zero. And we might as well assume a and q are relatively prime. <coughs> Why would I assume a and q are relatively prime? Yeah, otherwise they could be reduced, and I've already counted them. Right? So there's no need, you don't want to count you know, the same subinterval multiple times. So look at m is going to be the union, little q goes from 1 to big Q, union a goes from 1 to little q, but a and q are relatively prime, um, a q. What's the first thing you think we should prove about these MAQs. What do you think we should try to prove about this decomposition? Maybe that it's disjoint. Excellent, that it's disjoint. Disjoint if n is big. You've always got to be careful, and, and do we really care what's going on for small n? I'll accept both answers. So why don't we care about what goes on for small n? If we're trying to see what's happening you know, in the limit, we only care what goes on from some point onward. So if we want to do something like all sufficiently large odd numbers, all sufficiently large even numbers, then yeah, just take n big. If you care about the statement all odd numbers, all even numbers, then you can't just do something like this. What you then have to do is you then have to handle either those cases by brute force, or you have to be more careful there. It makes sense that these should be disjoint. What's the closest two different a over q's could be? they really can't be closer than 1 over big Q, right? They've got to be at least you know, somewhat well separated. Or maybe I could have two things really close. You know, this should be, maybe it's 1 over Q squared. This should be some way to tell how close two of them could be. If I have A over Q minus A tilde over Q tilde, this is AQ minus A tilde Q tilde over Q Q tilde. Right? We want to know how close could two rationals be. What can you tell me about the numerator? What do we know about the numerator here? This is a common observation. We do this all the time in number theory. These two are disjoint, so what must be true about the numerator? In fact, it's related to something I was saying before class today. It's not going to be zero. Why is it not going to be zero? These are different rationals, so it's not going to be zero. So what can you tell me about the numerator? 
If it's not 0, what do we know about it if it's not 0? It's, it's at least 1 in absolute value. And the denominators here, the smallest these can be is big Q. So this has to be greater than or equal to 1 over big Q squared. So there's going to be a significant difference between them, a significant distance between them. And if you look at the size of our intervals, the size of our intervals, you know, maq is of size 2q over n, which is much, 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 much smaller than 1 over q squared when n is big. So these intervals are really well separated. So the idea is we're trying to break down the analysis of integrating these functions over 0, 1. We showed if we could evaluate this one integral, we would know how many ways there are of representing our number. This is a damn hard integral to do. So we're trying to break the integral up into two parts. The major part, the major arcs where the function is large, and the minor arcs where the function is small. If these major arcs intersected, this would be very bad. Fortunately, these major arcs are distinct. They're disjoint. Okay? So again, this is another very common trick. You know, at least one, since it's an integer and not zero. So that observation is used in many, many problems. If you have a non-zero integer, it's at least one in absolute value. Okay? This is a key step in proving uh, lots and lots of things. All right, so now we've got these major arcs. What's the next question we might want to ask about them? We know that they are disjoint. What's the next thing you might want to know about them? So we know they're disjoint. You're a very uncurious bunch this morning. What would you like to know about them? They aren't all of 0, 1. So related to that, how much of 0, 1 are they? So it seems reasonable to know how much are they. So let's calculate the length of the major arcs. Let's get an upper bound. It's going to be less than or equal to the sum of q, less than or equal to big Q, less than or equal to the sum of a, less than or equal to q. I'll keep the aq relatively prime. And then I've got the length of each of these individual ones. All right. What is the length of each individual one? It's just 2q over n. So we have a sum q less than or equal to q, a sum a less than or equal to q, a and q are relatively prime, and we'll get 2 big Q over n. All right, what's the a sum? phi of q. And now we need to sum phi of q over q less than or equal to q. We can do it. There's ways to do it. It's not entirely pleasant. But we're just trying to get an upper bound. <laughs> just drop the condition. Most of the time, phi of q is not going to be that small. Right? There'll be a positive percent of the time when phi of q is large. And so, in terms of just getting an order of magnitude estimate of this, this is going to be correct order of magnitude. We could do a little bit of work and get a lower bound. I don't really care for lower bound. You know, let's just get a good upper bound. What's the sum now of a less than or equal to q? q. And now I sum q up to big Q. What's the sum of little q from 1 to big Q? Q times Q plus 1. So because you just made a mistake, and this could have caused the entire theory to come crashing down as somebody realizes later that you've made a small mistake, and now we have to go back and see, does any subsequent calculation depend on the fact that you had that perfect estimate? I always like to overestimate. So I erase the AQ equals, I'm going to erase the Q over here and replace that with a big Q. 
This is going to only change things by about a factor of two. Okay. Again, for those of you in CS, doubling your runtime is not a good idea. Okay. This is not the type of problem we're doing. We're not really concerned with the runtime. We're just concerned with you know roughly order of magnitude. How do things grow with n? Q big Q goes with n. Well, instead of summing all a up to little q that are relatively prime, just sum all a up to big Q. Now I've got q up to big Q, a up to big Q. This is just Q squared. So this whole thing would be 2q cubed over n. With a little bit of work, we could do better than this. But there's no need. And if there's no need, why spend the time trying to do better just for the sake of doing better? OK? If you think about the name major arcs, are you surprised that the major arcs have so little mass? It's major because that's where the most of the contribution is coming from. So you know, there's two ways to interpret the statement. OK, so now we have the major arc. And the goal is to understand what's going on with our function on the major arc. So what we want to do is we want to integrate over the major arc aq of fn cubed aq e to the negative nx. Uh, sorry. And this would be to write things as a sum of three primes. If I wanted to do two primes, what would I change? Square. Yeah, I would change this to a square. If I wanted to do s primes, I would do it to the s. So when you have an integral like this, we have these major arcs centered at a over q. And then what we could do is we would then sum a less equal to q, a and q are relatively prime, and then we would sum q less equal to big Q. And this would be the contribution over the major arcs. What's nice is we now have a lot of sums coming into play. We have a sum over q, we have a sum over a. We know what fn cubed looks like, at least if we plug in x equals a over q. You know, we have a main term and we have something small. So one idea is to tailor expand fn cubed or fn. And then you have the zeroth order term. The zeroth order term has no motion at all. We can evaluate it exactly, pull it out, and then just show that the lower order terms contribute something smaller. It turns out that's not the best way to do this problem. It turns out rather than doing a Taylor series expansion, it's better to choose another function which is close to fn and agrees with fn um, at a over q, and then disagrees by a very small amount elsewhere. And this function is easy to integrate. <coughs> so if you think about it, integration is hard. And if you can pass to something that's easy to integrate, that's often worthwhile. So at this point, we could spend days going through you know, lots of integrations, lots of algebra, lots of calculations. This is not the best way to use class time. This is where you read the book. And so in the book, I am not going through the minor arc calculations in much detail at all. If you really want to see a proof of this, you've got to go read a book that has the minor arcs. Mel Nathanson has a beautiful book on uh, additive number theory, the classical bases, which goes through and does these calculations in great detail. That's, you know, there's, there's many sources which go through and do the calculations. The major arc calculations typically aren't that bad. They just become very involved. And so we, step one is we approximate fn of x for x near a over q. And what we typically do is we write x equals a over q plus beta. And the whole idea is by writing it as a over q plus beta, we plug this in, and then we pull out a nice multiplicative factor that depends on a over q, and then we get a new function just of beta. The reason that this is such a good thing to do is it puts all the major arcs on the same footing. We want to be able to tackle all these integrals at the same time. Well, they essentially differ in really small amounts. They differ by just shifting things a little bit over here. The actual calculations, the actual integration should be very similar. So by doing a coordinate shift like this, we can attack all of them simultaneously. Okay? And then we take our new approximating function, we get a new function that we're going to be integrating over beta over these very small intervals. All right, so we approximate our function 
and then do the integration for the approximate function. And then execute the sums. So if you think about this, this looks like a very pleasant thing maybe to sum over A, especially if Q is prime. And if Q is prime, summing this over A, what kind of sum do we have if Q is prime? So if, if Q is prime, what kind of sum will we have? Geometric. We'll have a geometric series. And your geometric series, we can actually handle without too much trouble. Unfortunately, most of the time, Q is not going to be prime. And then what you have to do is you have to figure out, well, what do we have in other cases? And it turns out these sums can be done. It's elementary number theory. Elementary does not necessarily mean easy. It often means tedious. But it can be done without using heavy machinery. You don't need to use complex analysis. You don't need to use high-powered results. You can just attack it directly. And so at the end of the day, when we try to figure out what we get, um, there are two ways to do this, the proper way and the improper way. <coughs> you know, the improper way is to say, ah, let's just approximate things and let's just replace this. Let's say the function is constant. And if the function is constant, I'm integrating it over something of length 2 big Q over n. So I'll multiply by 2 big Q over n. I'm going to have an n cubed over phi cubed. So I'll have an n squared over phi cubed. And I then do all the different sums, and I have a certain expression. If you do that, you're close. The answer you get differs by a couple of logarithms. It's approximately the right answer to just say, let's just pretend this function is constant on the major arcs. It's not, it's not changing by a huge amount. And you'll be correct up to a few logarithms. Typically, is it OK if you're, up, if you're correct up to just a few logarithms? So the number of primes up to x is about x log x. I'm correct to within two logarithms. Right? The number of primes up to x is x log x. That's correct up to a log squared x. Log squared x is small relative to x. Right? It depends on the situation. Depending on the situation, you've got to be very careful about how many logarithms you save. The harder the problem, the more logarithms you have to save. And this is where things get really difficult and tricky. If you already have a power cancellation, then you don't worry so much about a couple of logarithms. You know, if I have a term of size, when we were doing, the, when we were doing counting primes, we had you know, pi of x plus pi of x to the 1 half plus pi of x to the 1 third. And we were trying to estimate what the contribution was. And one of the things we said is, well, each one of these pieces is at most x. We have at most log x pieces. The size of this is at most x to the 1 half log x. And this is an overestimate for what this is, but this is so much smaller than what pi of x is. It's fine to overestimate like this. A better estimate for this would be x to the 1 half plus x to the 1 third log x. That's a much better estimate, but I don't really need an estimate this accurate. So in terms of you know, trying to save powers of logarithm, it depends on the situation. In a situation like this, I can be very crude with the logarithms. Unfortunately for the circle method, we don't win by much. And that's the problem, is these functions are highly oscillatory. They're, high, they're very hard to understand. Uh, numerically, they're extremely hard to explore because you know, we have, let n be very large. Uh, so you, we're doing these highly oscillatory sums with huge numbers of things. We have parameters like q is log n to some power b, and b is going to be a big number depending on siegel walshitz So numerically, it's very hard to explore what's going on here and get a real flavor for what's happening. I'm trying to just give you the big picture right now. And so over here, we've got to be a little bit careful with the logarithms. If we just tried a zeroth order Taylor series expansion, we're close, but we miss by some logarithms, and that is going to matter. So what we have to do is we have to be a little bit more careful. We have to replace our function with a function that's very close to it, but is much easier to integrate. 
And at the end of the day, we get this wonderful expression. We get um, the integral over the matrix of fn cubed of x e to the negative and x dx is equal to sigma n or sn sn times I want to say n squared over two plus small, where sn and I think the tech community is slash goth. I'm not. I'm pretty sure. Is equal to the following. It is the sum. Q goes from one to infinity. One over phi of Q cubed. The sum a less than or equal to Q. A and Q are relatively prime. The sum r less than or equal to Q. R and Q are relatively prime. E to the A R over Q cubed E to the negative N A over Q. OK. So does this look reasonable? You know, again, we are skipping a huge number of calculations. And I'm just jumping to the answer. Well, let's see. Fn, we knew was roughly of size n over phi of q. So when I cube it, I should get an n cubed over phi cubed. But the major arcs of size, you know, q over n, so I should lose one of the n. I should get something of size n squared up to logarithms. Good, I've got something of size n squared. When I look at it, I have. Uh, every time I do a major arc, remember I wanted to change things to replace x as a over q plus beta. So the action is happening near the point a over q. So for each major arc, what's really going on is this function over here. I can essentially replace x with a over q. That's where this piece is coming from over here. This piece is coming from the main term of the fn. It's just the sum of r, the e a r over q. And then I'm cubing it because I have fn cubed. So this part makes a lot of sense. And then this is just summing over all the major arcs. And there's the 1 over phi cubed that we had. We can pull that outside because that doesn't depend on a. So it makes a lot of sense that we have this. So we have reduced the problem to showing that this quantity is small. And then showing, I'm sorry, to showing that this quantity is non-zero. And then showing that the contribution of the minor arcs is less than this contribution. If this looks nice to anybody, you have a very different vision than I do. I cannot look at this and make too much heads or tails of it. What is the biggest danger about an expression like this? What is the thing we fear? I'm sorry? No, no, I'm saying, for the, what would be a horrible value for this to take on? You know, it would completely destroy our method if this sum equaled zero. We don't want the main term to be zero. Right? Then that means that the answer to our problem is contained in our error term. We want the main term to be larger than the error term. The naming helps us. Right? So the difficulty is, can you look at this and show that for given choice of big N that this is not zero? Yes. Um, it pops up, we, we only go up to big Q, but this sum is going to converge well. Okay. And so because it converges well, we can extend the sum up to infinity. Okay. Uh, excellent point, and this gets you know, pushed into the small error. Okay. So we've got you know, basically 1 over phi cubed, which looks pretty good. OK. So it turns out there's a way to rewrite this sum. We can rewrite it as a product. Let me just make sure I get this written down correctly. Over all primes p of 1 minus cp of n over phi of p cubed with cp of n equals p minus 1 if p divides n and 0 otherwise. 
And so we often write this as a product over P of, we'll call it delta P of N. OK. Oh, the camera didn't seem to want to move. OK, sorry. All right, so let's try to get it. Going from here to here is a lot of algebra. What kind of function am I essentially saying that this equals? Not an L function. Alphabetically, it is close to L. So what kind of function is it if I can write it like this? It does look a lot like an Euler product. It's not an Euler product, but it does, it does have something similar. It does have a similar feel. You know, what's, the, what's the big word for something like this? I'm writing it as a product. It's a... So this is a multiplicative function. Right? If we can understand it at primes, we can then build up. So the idea is to try to understand what's going on at primes, build up, and show that that's how we get it. Does it look like this should be a multiplicative function? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on here. And until you really get your hands dirty, it's not going to be clear what's going on here. And so again, this is the question of what is the best use of your time? I know you're all busy with lots of different things. I would much rather have you trying your hand at some research projects. I would much rather just give you a general exposure. I want you to be aware of what's out there. To go into the nuts and bolts of this, I feel is suboptimal. If you want me to, I am happy to rearrange the rest of the semester. You can email me directly anonymously and say, I want to see technical details. I want to see long, tedious calculations. And I'm happy, well, I don't have happy, but I'm willing to do that. I'm just trying to really bias you right now in how I'm phrasing this by saying, I don't think that's the best use of our time. You should be aware of the existence of the circle method. And you should be aware of what's going on. And you should be aware of the key brushstrokes as to how we get things done. But the nuts and bolts of how we get from here to here, if you're not really working in this field, it's not worth our time. And you can read my book, which is basically heavily inspired by Nathanson. You can read them next to each other and see, wow, it's very heavily inspired by Nathanson and just see how you would pass from something like this to something like this. A lot of it comes down to finding formulas for these things. And once we have formulas for these things, then playing all sorts of games. The way you should look at this is this is a product of local obstructions or local checks. If I want to write my number as a sum of three primes, or a sum of two primes, or sums of squares, or whatever, there may be certain local obstructions that prevent me from doing it. For instance, if I want to write um, a number as the sum of two squares, what numbers do you think can be written as sums of two squares? I'm sorry? Three can? What numbers can be written as the sum of two squares? 25. 25. What else? So anything that's a perfect square, absolutely. But let's, let's take numbers that are not perfect squares. Which numbers that are not perfect squares can be written as the sum of two squares? So I want to write um, x1 squared plus x2 squared equals n. And I want to know which values of n is it possible for me to do this. Five. So n equals 5 works. Large n. Does, do you think this holds for all values of n? Give me a value of n where I can't write it as the sum of two squares. Three. three. Six. Do you know what three and six have in common? <laughs> So if you, so look, if you look, look at the numbers, numbers, if, numbers. if x1 is even, then x1 squared is 0 mod 4. If x1 is odd, then x1 squared is 1 mod 4. So mod 4, we either have 0, 1, or 2. We never have 3 mod 4. So we can't write anything that's 3 mod 4 
as the sum of uh, two squares. Now, 6 is not 3 mod 4. 6 is 2 mod 4. So there should be a chance. 6 is also a small number. And you, maybe there's some issues there, maybe not. I don't want to go all the way into that. What I want you to see right here, very simply, is there is a natural obstruction to certain numbers n. And it seems a little strange, you know, if I just replace n with n plus 1, that can be enough to force me not to have any hope of having a solution. You know, for instance, imagine n is 2 mod 4, then there's a chance. If I add 1, n is now 3 mod 4, there is no chance. Think of what that means if you're trying to do a circle method argument. Your main term can come crashing down to 0 if you increase n by 1. You talk about extreme sensitivity. You go from having a main term of size n squared and the minor arcs giving something smaller to the main term vanishing. Okay? The local obstructions here essentially codify this. They tell you when you have difficulties. For the most part, there's really not much of a problem. You know, CP of n is p minus 1 if p divides n and 0 otherwise. Okay, well, what is phi of p equal to? p minus 1. All right, so this is now a p minus 1 cubed. And since you know, this is equal to 0 if p divides n, I can just restrict myself to p dividing n. And what is CP of n equal? It equals p minus 1 in that case. I have p minus 1 divided by p minus 1 cubed. This isn't so bad. If only we had homework problems talking. Oh, we did have homework problems about infinite products. Excellent. All right. So we have some sense of when this will converge. We need to know that the sum of 1 over p minus 1 squared converges. Well, that sum is clearly less than the sum of 1 over n squared, which converges. So product converges as the sum of 1 over p minus 1 squared is less than equal to the sum of 1 over n squared, which converges. Yay, our product converges. Is there anything to worry about? It might converge to zero. Is there any way this product would converge to zero? I mean, you take you know, all of these terms. You know, you, are we fine? Or, are we fine, or is there something we have to worry about? Oh no, what if p equals 2? If p equals 2, what happens? We get 1 minus 1 over 2 minus 1 squared. If p equals 2, what do we get? Delta 2 of an even number is 0. So if you try to write an even number as the sum of 3 primes, the method self-destructs and the main term becomes 0. This is one of my favorite, if not my favorite example of mathematics not giving you anything for free. <laughs> no, I mean, th this is, I mean, if you want to talk about conspiracy theories, <laughs> this, I think, is, is a wonderful leading candidate. OK? Um, all of my classes you know, are blending together. But I assume at some point this semester there has been a smart ass in the class who, when I have asked for something, has given me a really trivial answer or whatnot for something. I'm sure this has happened at least once. So back door to Goldbach. One. Hard to do P1 plus P2 equals N. Two. Easier to do P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals M. Because you have more things and you have more cancellation. 
3. Let m equal um, n minus 2. Oh, how, how do I want to do this? Let n. So what I want to do is let's let n be even. Let, right, m be even. Then if p1 plus p2 plus p3 equals m, and we'll say m equals um, n plus 2. What can you tell me if p1 plus p2 plus p3 equals m? One of them is 2. Which one? I know which one I would choose to be one to be two. P two. P two. No. No. P three. I would choose P three to be two because then I reduce something to the form P one plus P two. To me, that seems more natural than the sum of P two plus P three. And if you've seen Monty Python, you know P two is right out. You don't choose the middle one. I mean, therefore, P three equals two. So you have P one plus P two plus two is n plus 2, therefore p1 plus p2 equals n. So the idea is if you could do the ternary Goldbach, if you could write even numbers as the sum of three primes, you would immediately get the binary Goldbach. The binary Goldbach is hard. You're trying to do a backdoor. You're trying to say, rather than dealing with a function that's a square and trying to get more you know, delicate in, you know, cancellation, the more primes I have, the easier it is. And so we're probably not going to have time to get to that today, so we'll have to save that for next time. So you know, we'll, we'll see when we do an analysis of the major arcs versus the minor arcs. The more primes you have, the smaller cancellation you need on the minor arcs. So the idea is, rather than doing it as the sum of two primes, do it as the sum of three primes. Observe that one of the primes has to be two, and aha, we've got it as a sum of two primes. The circle method is too smart for that. And if you try to do that, the circle method actually self-destructs. And when you do the calculation, you end up getting the main term is 0. That does not mean that you can't write an even number as the sum of two primes. It just means that the analysis you're doing, your main term is 0, and you have to be far more careful. So. Uh, what we're going to do for next class is I will have you guys, you know, reading, next class is going to be on Wednesday, presenting a little bit from some of the stuff you've read on the circle method, some of the key ideas. Um, I will first talk a little bit about how we do the bounding of the minor arcs and getting a sense of what their contribution is. Unfortunately, we only really know one technique to understand integrations. And so I'll just mention what the technique is going to be. Essentially, that if you want to integrate over the minor arcs of fn cubed of x e to the minus nx dx, essentially the only thing we know how to do is move the absolute value inside the integral. That's essentially all we really know how to do. At some point, all the analyses involves moving the absolute value inside the integral. Why is that a bad thing to do? To add up all of your errors instead of having something Yeah. All of our oscillation is gone. Well, not all the oscillation. We still have some of the oscillation inside Fn. But the fact that we're now integrating it against this highly oscillatory function, we're losing that. And that's the problem with this approach. So, all right, so I'm going to stop here.